Okay, let's turn the music down so we can get the program started. And we can hear everything. We're just going to talk nice and loud so we don't have to use microphones and it can be nice and informal, interactive discussion. I'm uh, Brent Schellinger, chair of the uh, Medical Society's Opioid Healthcare Response Initiative. And we'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to Palm Beach County Medical Society Services Opioid Educational Seminar Series. This year, we're trying something a little different. We're calling this Meet and Greet, M-E-A-T and Greet, because those of you who are lucky enough to be here in person have an opportunity to try some of this Wagyu beef meat that they have here at the Palm Beach Meats facility. And it's also an opportunity for us to uh, network and to learn some important things in terms of the opioid and substance use uh, disorder arena. So let me mention that our, our program uh, is, is part of this Opioid Healthcare Response Initiative. We started about 2017, and from the, uh, from the get-go, we focused on a lot of areas, because opioids and substance use is very complicated. So we've always looked at prevention, we've looked at identification and rescue of people in crisis, we've looked at treatment and long-term recovery, all of those aspects. So our committee and this program is funded through the Health Council of Southeast Florida. So our speaker this evening is Heather Howard. Heather Howard, PhD, who's associate professor at the Phyllis and Harvey Sandler School of Social Work at Florida Atlantic University. Before coming to FAU, Heather spent a number of years in the New England area, specifically at the Boston University's Wheelock College and with Brown University, Rhode Island affiliated hospitals. Her research and teaching has focused on gender-specific and trauma-informed care that reduces stigma and encourages health empowerment. Heather's clinical expertise is through a social work lens, and the expertise focuses specifically on prevention modalities and treatment of patients with substance use disorders. Let me just say one thing before we bring Heather in. A lot of experts will tell you that addiction, this terrible disease of addiction, is actually enabled by the attitudes of the healthcare providers who are supposed to deliver this care to the patients in need. With that in mind, Heather will elaborate on that and give us some important guidance on how hopefully we can deliver some higher levels of compassionate care to this segment of our patient population. Heather. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here this evening. This is such a nice, lovely space. And um, I'm really excited to try this food. It smells amazing. So, is everybody enjoying it? Yeah. Excellent. Great. So, I really kind of wanted to start how I ended up in doing research around um, women that are experiencing substance use. And I was at uh, Brown University based hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. It's called Women Infants Hospital. It's also women's oncology. And it was really the turn of the century and many of the women were prescribed opioids. And whether it was, you know, an, an accident and they or a dental treatment and then subsequently later found themselves pregnant and they were really at a quagmire because at that time there really wasn't standardized care. And there was this this fear of punitive responses if they um, continued, obviously, with, with the substance use, but they were also afraid of their infants having neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAUS, if they were put on medication. So there, we have so much more uh, standards of treatment now and good practices, but at that time, there was really a lot of um, powerlessness. But what I noticed as a clinician was a lot of stigma. So subsequently went in to um, go back to school and um, earn um, my PhD. And my, my dissertation was on the decision-making process for women with an opioid use disorder who become pregnant. So not only what was their prenatal care experience, but what was their treatment experience for accessing care and substance use. And one of the major findings, um, it was 20 women across New England that um, I interviewed was that they experienced tremendous stigma and that they did not have any really voice in their decision making. 
there were two outliers in this small sample that had support. One was from a maternal health nurse and the other one was for, from an OB-GYN. And they really shared how those, those providers were so impactful in their, not only in their care and prenatal and postpartum care and their substance use treatment, but also in their life. One attributes the, the care that she received from the OB guy that she went back to school to receive her GED. Um, and the other outlier she shared about the nurse that, you know, she was like a mother to me and uh, she actually went into treatment for the first time. And she was using um, illicit Percocets at the time. So that kind of propelled me of what is this support from healthcare providers that's propelling these individuals to access treatment. Because I knew from the literature, the scientific literature, that stigma is one of the largest barriers to treatment engagement. So what, is, what does that look like and how, how are we able to engage patients in a non-stigmatic way? So I've had several studies after that, and I'm not gonna go into those studies, but one um, area that I teach also at the College of Medicine with the Medical 3 students on non-stigmatic approaches um, as they engage with, with patients. And such a big, big pro proponent of empowering physicians and feeling that they feel empowered to be able to support individuals that have substance use disorders or just substance use. So how, how um, anybody, Everybody in primary care in the room, or is anybody? Yes, yay, <laughs> awesome. And anyone emergency medicine or? Okay, psychiatry? Mm -hmm. All right. we're all part time. Part time, okay. I love <laughs> primary care and really addressing this. You know, um, I, if we had more time, we only have about 20 minutes. I love to do an exercise, a reflective exercise of what it might like to be like to have a substance use um, disorder. And it's a reflexive exercise, we don't have time. But the end of the exercise, it's, it's a difficult exercise and only a few people want to continue on of this experience of what it's like. And that is, represents that only a small percentage actually receive treatment. Is everybody aware of that? You know that we have up to 20 million people that are suffering and only 10% actually receive treatment. So obviously we're not doing a great job, right? And we wanna improve that, we wanna have better outcomes. So today I really just wanna speak about how we all can be non-stigmatic because we, we are not gonna be addiction specialists and that's not what this is about. It's how can you engage patients in a non-stigmatic way to promote treatment engagement. So, is everybody familiar with stigma theory? Did anybody study sociology back in undergrad or medical school a little bit? So you're probably familiar with Dr. Goffman. He was a sociologist and he created the stigma theory and it really is a social construction that's based on a human characteristic. And as a result, somebody is really dehumanized and devalued. So individuals with substance use are actually the most highly stigmatized group in the U.S. And what are the feelings of stigma? Can anybody name? Shame. Shame is a huge, absolutely. And that, that is such a powerful emotion, right? I think we've all experienced shame. I, I ask the, the medical students that I work with, think about the worst thing that you've done in your life that you're really not proud of and now tell me it. And of course, no, nobody's gonna tell me, right? <laughs> it's like, that's what we expect our patients to do. Tell them something that they're very, very ashamed of. And it's a powerful emotion. Just a really quick story. When I was actually conducting the interviews uh, it, for the, my dissertation, there was one woman who had, was incarcerated for some of her pregnancy. Um, in the re-entry, she delivered, the baby di was, in, in the NICU and she was bedside in the NICU and because she felt such shame 
and feeling like it, it was absolutely her fault and that she was the reason that her neonate, her infant, was not doing well, she fled. She left the NICU. And she shared with me in the interview, I know the nurses and the physicians and the social workers thought that I went out to use, but I didn't use. I just couldn't tolerate the emotional stress and pain. And as she was sharing this story, I had my clinical researcher hat on, but I had also 20 years of clinical social work experience working in the NICU. And I said, I was one of those social workers that thought that. It was really convicting for me and really thinking about how it's so important for us to reflect of what our personal judgments are, right? Um, and thinking about how we can, again, be non-stigmatic and be present with someone bedside or when they're really struggling and be really a gateway to someone asking for help because they're trying to tolerate intense shame. So really quickly, there's kind of three levels of this multi-dimensional of stigma. It's been studied a little bit more that there's structural stigma, right? Where the policies that we have, can you think of structural stigma for individuals that have substance use? It's illegal. It's they go to jail. Exactly. The criminal justice system, if you're a parent, the child welfare system, so child removal. Enacted stigma is when those, those policies, right, are en enacted on the individual. And then... Even employment. Employment, huge. Housing, health care, right? It's a great, great example. So the anticipated or the internalized stigma is when the individual actually feels the shame and not human. Um, so you imagine feeling that way and having, you know, um, the strength or the courage to actually go to the ER or go to the primary care and physician and have a conversation. When you know most likely that you will be judged, it's asking, it's really asking a lot. So what, what can we do, you know, in that environment? We need to do better. I was, I just really quickly, I don't want to um, go into the stats too, too much, but I work with the Palm Beach, um, the data to action. So we're evaluating um, the different committees that we're doing in the strategic plan in the, in the county. But unfortunately, the overdose deaths did increase from 2020 to 21 by 2.3%. The um, 44 people died of an overdose in Palm Beach County in 2021. An average of 1.8 people die each day and the really significant was suicide by overdose increased 147 percent from 2020. And one of the four deaths involved a novel psychoactive substance. So in addition to the fentanyl, right, we're seeing the stimulants. So really I like to talk about this from, you know, substance use, not specifically just to opioid. Um, so we still, again, need to do better, right? We need to decrease the stigma in substance use and mental health. So what do you, what do you think um, that's helpful, or what have you done? Well, you have to recognize their courage. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here. That was hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's huge. How do you? How can I help you? What do you expect? You know. What What can I do to help? Yeah. That's excellent. Did everybody hear that in the back? No. You say it. We can repeat it. Okay. For we folks can repeat. Okay. How can I help you? It was brave for you to come. Thank you for sharing that, right? Uh, anything else? Yeah. I think that telling them to let them know that it can happen to anyone. Right. That it's not their fault, but it happened to them. <clears throat> that it could have happened to me. Mm hmm Right. Yeah, that's excellent. Good. Any suggestions from the primary care lens? <laughs> Most of the time people come to the office not to tell you that they have a substance abuse issue. They're coming in on the pretense of another issue. 
Right. And you need to be a good listener. Good listener. To be able to figure out what they're really telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about using universal screening? Yeah. Right? Yeah. The statistics are not too favorable in terms of how many providers use standardized measurements such as SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, but that's one way also um, having that, you know, in primary care, in practice, so it's just part of the conversation each time. SBIRT, yeah, we, we've done several done? seminars Excellent. on that, but I agree with you that in the community, this is a low priority in mm -hmm. many settings, right. uh, and yet insurance will pay for it. Mm, insurance will pay for it. Mm -hmm. We actually had a podcast with the researcher who testified before Congress to get Medicare to come up with a code for it. Oh, excellent. So yeah. the awareness, we Is need to continue case? to get that awareness yeah. out there. Yeah. That's great. So any, any other suggestions? I think what you're doing with the medical students oh, is critical. Oh. Um, you really do need to teach them to listen. Listen. And to ask questions. And to spend a few more minutes just sitting and asking questions and listening before you get up and do the exam, before you do the testing, because this is not what they've been taught for many years. You know, right. They have to order some more tests, order another imaging study, but to sit and listen and learn the type of interviewing skills that you're teaching is right. critical. Mm -hmm. let, them, let them learn to ask the question that they listen. Right, right, yeah, that's excellent, thank you. How many, and I don't want you to answer, just think about it in your head, how many of you think that substance use disorder is a choice versus a chronic brain disease, episodic brain disease, you know, and I don't want you to answer it because it's really self-reflection, right? And depending on how you answered that will be how, the, how you are with your patients. And we know that there's, you know, higher stigma if something, if you feel that someone is in control of something and it's their choice versus less control and less of a choice. For exa example, cancer, right? Less control, less of a choice. And you have this continuum. So, yeah, thinking about, about that. And, you know, I'll be the first one to admit, I started my um, first beginning of my practice in a pediatric community health center with three pedi pediatricians. They finished their residency at Brown with me when I finished my internship at Boston College and they said we're going into this area we're, go we're not going without a clinical social worker so I've been working with physicians since 1992 and I really am such a proponent in integrative health and working as a team but at the beginning of my career I really was uh, very judgmental towards parents with a substance use disorder and years subsequent years later working in women's health and seeing the human side of it and the high adverse childhood experiences with women that subsequently develop alcohol and substance use disorder really increased my compassion and my empathy you know in hearing the story so I'm the first person now a lot of my research is family preservation trying to keep families together and not having penalized policies that really um, just create this multi-generational history of trauma, right? So the big takeaway with the stigma, you all had great suggestions, also is language and first-person language. I was reviewing a manuscript today, they cited NIDA, right? And it actually had stigmatic, stigmatic languages from a citation in 2021. I said, this is, this is unbelievable, right? Because it's somebody that just does research in substance use and the language still is stigmatic. In the, in the citation it said it used addict as a noun versus first person language. So if you find yourself in a conversation with someone and they, they speak about someone with a history or current substance use as an addict or an alcoholic, I'm, I'm usually very quick to say Heather with substance use disorder right and, it, and we know in the research too that that really shifts our attitudes towards patients using first person language so that's this is a cultural shift if anybody's had a history with AA right 
part of the the work is my name is Heather and I'm an alcoholic so it's it's a huge shift um, but that this language really um, promotes internalized and enacted stigma which can prevent people from accessing treatment so the language is really the most important in terms of the takeaway and that's easy to remember right remembering someone as the person first and not the disease right the other uh, is a model that's used in health behavior it's called self-determination theory is anybody familiar with self-determination theory it, c it consists of two psychological factors within health behavior one is the patient's confidence for their change in the behavior and the other one is their sense of autonomy with treatment for substance use there's not a lot of that <laughs> right a lot of it's you have to do this right there isn't a lot of autonomy and support for their competence. So, um, what you know, what it looks like is supporting somebody's autonomy and also believing in them that they can do it. So, meeting them where they're at, which is you know what was your your examples right there. And a lot of times, it's the first time if a healthcare professional does that that they're re actually receiving support for their self determination. Nobody's asked them what do you think or what do you think is best or I believe that you can do this right um, so that can be very very transformational and it's been this has been studied for over two decades this theory with health behavior with smoking cessation and treatment for opioid use disorder so one way to remember it is if you all have had ever a health behavior change right um, maybe you know thinking maybe about change in nutrition or change in exercise or um, usually you had some autonomy in that sure. somebody wasn't forcing you right <laughs> that you and you also had somebody supporting that your confidence that you're able to do it you probably had one person but a lot of a lot of and you you know you've spoken about this some of the patients you've worked with they don't have that one person right they've they've lost they don't have anyone that right so sometimes you're it. You're that person, which is huge. Um, and that it, it can be so transformational. Um, maybe I can share just a story about the self determination and how, how um, you know, I've, I've seen it work. Um, in, in my practice, I worked with pregnant and postpartum women with substance use disorder. And there were some cases that were so dismal and thinking that they could never parent. And uh, one in particular was, she was using um, illicit buprenorphine. And this was about 2015. She couldn't find any provider at all. It's, it's very, very hard for pregnant women to find a provider um, for buprenorphine because they don't feel comfortable treating pregnant women. And then if they are in treatment with a pro provider, addiction psychiatry or addiction specialist when they become pregnant they don't feel comfortable treating a pregnant so it, it, it's really a very vicarious situation so this this woman was obtaining it on the streets and then when her baby was born the baby had now's neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome the neonatologist um, paged me and said you have to come down because mom just disclosed that she had been using her uh, partner wasn't aware. She lived with her partner, and um, you need to like remove her from the room because it was it was really becoming uncomfortable. She was she was withdrawing, and the dad was becoming really upset. So sometimes in the hospital with these situations, we call security. Does anybody <laughs> have similar situations like this? It was almost at that level, okay. And um, but I I went down and I said. Would you please come with me to the family room? And he, dad was extremely upset because he hadn't, he hadn't known that his partner was using buprenorphine and mom was not even uh, looking at me or him because of what? Shame. Shame. 
So as we're walking down the hall, I said, what am I going to do with this situation? <laughs> and I remembered the, the research that I had just finished of how, with those two outliers, and how those two outliers provided support for self-determination. And I said, all right, I'm just going to pilot test myself. And so I was sitting next to the mom, and the dad is just pacing, you know, almost punching the walls. It was, you know, really intense. And um, she wouldn't look at me, and she wouldn't answer any questions, and her shoulders were really slunched over. And I said, were you af afraid uh, to ask for help? And all of a sudden, you know, she went back a little bit, and her shoulders kind of weren't as hunched, and she looked up a little bit, and then her eyes started welling up and with tears. And the dad was listening, and I just kind of validated that experience and how she wasn't able to access help and how scary that was. And then the dad came over in front of us and said, do you mean she didn't do this on purpose? And I said, I exactly mean that. And he proceeded to sit next to her and put his arm around her and said, we're going to figure this out. We're going we're gonna to find you some help. He went into like dad action, you know, husband action. And it was just so beautiful because I didn't have to do anything. And providing, you know, providing, listening and providing that support for her autonomy and her voice. And then um, in a non stigmatic way. And then dad came over and she had support from the person that she cared about the most, right? Which was so much more powerful than a physician or a clinical social worker doing that. Um, huge, difference. huge difference, huge difference, and the, the infant wasn't removed, and uh, she received treatment, and she also went on Suboxone prescribed, right? So it, it really was an excellent um, positive outcomes. The, um, the other final, so we talked about first person language, right? Everybody still with me? self-determination, right? And to remember that is you don't like to be told what to do, right? You don't like to be forced to do a, ch a health behavior change. And the final is shared decision making. Has anybody heard shared decision making? So it's used in very, you know, high anxiety provoking kind of decision making. And um, it's you have this discussion with your patient of the risks and benefits really. And you incorporate what's important to you. So you also incorporate the patient's values and what they think, and they're fully informed, though, of the risks and benefits of the different choices, and that you and then you support them what they think is best for them. And if it's not successful, you can go back to the drawing table, right? In the next visit, you can talk about it. And over the last decade, we've done a lot of research on the, the a positive impact of the use of shared decision making with the treatment of substance use. Really exciting, because again, that's, that's something that everybody can practice. Um, and again, it's under this non-stigmatic approach, right? The self-determination and the shared decision-making, because you're not feeling judged. You know, you, you, somebody's listening to your, what you think and what your voice is. Um, so this has been a great overview with some great examples. So we have plenty of time to have some audience questions and interaction. Do, do we need a special microphone so that everybody uh, watching this can get this? Or should we just go ahead? Just go ahead. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions first. Let's go back to the obvious, you know, stigma, obviously not a nice thing. Right, right. You've done the research, the evidence-based data. Why is it so common and why is it so bad? Right, it's, right. We know the answer, but we want to hear your answer. Sure, sure. I mean, the biggest is that stigma inhibits and is the major barrier to treatment engagement. And I go back to that only 10% receive treatment. I mean, when we think about this with any other diseases, if only 10% receive treatment. So, um, you know, there's, there's other barriers with, you know, lack of of treatment providers, but really the main that we're seeing is the stigma and, you know, this overwhelming sense of, of shame 
and feeling not human, feeling devalued. Making the patient feel that way. Exactly. So among healthcare workers, uh -huh. who would you say is the most guilty? And among uh, medical doctors, what specialty is the most guilty? I wouldn't, I would, yeah, I wouldn't label, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't label, I feel like it's everybody has individual judgment. We all have judgment over, right? And that it's, so it's not like one particular specialty. I mean, my field, social work, we've done so much harm in um, really irreparable damage with families and child welfare. So. I want to be a change maker and I want to have restorative practices and I think um, if you're in the emergency room, because I worked in the ER for 13 years for psychiatric emergencies, I know what occupational burnout is. <laughs> and, there, and was there plenty of stigma in the emergency room setting? Yes, because you're tired, you're overwhelmed, you have way too many patients um, and you don't have support. You don't have support. So one, you know, we, we discussed this. Um, probably in the last time we spoke about I initiated debriefing sessions in the ER and just really supporting one another and when we had these difficult cases let's talk about it in a non-judgmental way right and it was really really helpful um, that we did that in the ER it was like once a, once a week non-mandatory but anybody that felt like they needed some some peer support really really helped but if I am with someone, if you were to set a really stigmatic approach, like number three, you know, the, the heroin addict is back in again, right? I have a responsibility either to agree with you or say first person language and I'm going to go and get a new assessment. I just want to see where he's at today. And then maybe you'll listen differently maybe you won't but at least we're starting to maybe try to change the culture because everybody wants to feel that they're making a difference and that really helping and you know that you want to have satisfaction in your work right so in your experience mm -hmm. how receptive have physicians generally been to these suggestions yeah I feel like I had a really great success at Brown University at the um, women infants hospital and it was finding champions, champions in maternal fetal health, champions in the NICU, champions in postpartum, and really saying, let's, let's work on this together and let's support one another and um, shifting the way business was done. Um, you know, one, one quick example was the power orders would automatically go through with C-sections for Percocet or Vicodin. So I had some really great conversations with the attending ahead of all the, the residents saying, why don't we do a standard universal assessment just to ensure that nobody has a familial history of substance use um, and that, that it, can we make this so it's not automatic. Um, and we had one woman that went home discharged and she had a fatal overdose and she had a five week old and she was just given dilaudid and um, they didn't know that she had a significant opioid use disorder. So we, ch we changed the way we, we ran um, you know, the protocol there to prevent, right? To prevent further fatal overdoses. So you've mentioned several times that a simple thing that healthcare providers can begin to do is change their language. language. So can you give us two or three specific examples so people who are watching this and who are here tonight can go home and tomorrow say, this is what I'm gonna do different? Right, absolutely. So that first person language, so identify the patient with their name first. That's pretty, pretty easy to, to remember, even when you're talking to your colleagues especially. And does this tie in also with, you don't call them an addict. Correct. But they are a person who suffers right. from the disease. Exactly. Addiction. So I said, if I labeled you as an addict versus Brent with the substance use, it's, we have, we have a different perception and perspective of caring for you, right? So that's one example. What about the reference we hear also, oh, are you still shooting up with the street drugs? Mm -hmm. What would be a better way to talk to a patient about that? 
So if someone, if you imagine that someone most likely has had tremendous trauma, adverse childhood experiences, because we know from the literature that individuals that develop a substance use disorder can have up to five to seven adverse childhood experiences. So if anybody's looked at that literature, it's public health, and um, we know that it has negative physical outcomes, but also more likely to develop mental health and substance use disorder. So that right there, I always really like a trauma-informed approach, and knowing that someone probably is coming in with a lot of history of trauma and then current trauma, right? With, with violence or they're experiencing homelessness or estranged from family members. So understanding that they have all that plus internalized shame shifts hopefully in your mind that you're not going to say what you just said. So what's a better thing to say? Tell me how you're doing. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you're here today. What's going on? What brought you in? Um, you know, has, have you ever had something really on your mind and someone really, really asks you how you are and really wants to know? It, it's, it's not very common because we're all <laughs> really busy, right? Just showing the patient that you but care. But when you really, really care and you listen, it's so transformational. Compassion. It's exactly. so, the compassion is so huge and it literally could be one to three minutes and they know and then they're more open to share, right? But if you go into it accusatory, accusatory then obviously it just sets up boundaries and barriers right away that it's more of an adversarial relationship. So we have some questions, comments. I know Jim, you've been holding that microphone for a while. I was going to make a comment on tobacco, as far as tobacco program. And one of the things we try to do in Actors on the Advisory Group is that we have, we give the doctor and his practice a wraparound support with the 1 800 Florida, the VA X, and all. And everything you said, I keep checking your medical students out here at this school. Listen, everything is in a lab mix. Right. You know, everything is, I'm going to order this, I'm going to order that. Uh, and the person is a human being. And, and, and we respect them as a fellow human being. Right. You know, but my question is, I'm sitting here like a doc here, say she's an internist, right? And a real agent comes in the office, right? How? I'm, I, I feel a little naked about where do I go from here? What, what is your so I want to stay I want to stay associated because you're a support system right. as a friend and a professional colleague and a, and a professional. But how do you how do you that now I've got the attic in my office. Or I someone with a substance use person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help. Them. So where do you uh, where yeah, do you uh, where do I in other words where's yeah. the what do you do? What do you advise on that? Yeah. So. A lot of people that we know in the literature, only about 20% screen of physicians. And it's what, what we know with the ESPER is we do great with the screening and the brief intervention, which is motivational interviewing, but the referral to treatment, it just drops off. Because what do you do? Okay, I'm, I'm scared if I screen positive, and then what am I gonna do with the patient? So I really um, am proponent of recovery community organizations and recovery community centers and creating peer support um, because someone might not want to actually right then and there engage in treatment but if they can start with uh, someone that has the lived experience and meet them where they're at in a non-judgmental way great so in Palm Beach County we have Rebel Recovery and we have um, the hub in Delray and we're now in on the visioning board in Lake Worth Beach then we're going to open up one in Belle Glade and Riviera Beach so it's going to be more accessible. And having whatever that number is of where the co recovery community center is, because you don't need any particular insurance, they will call back within 24 hours business day. And they will see the, see the consumer. And, and um, they can be as long as they want. And they can come back even if they leave. It's non-punitive. And the, it's tremendous, tremendous uh, success 
and people entering early recovery and then going into long-term re recovery. So that's that's something that's you know that you that you can do a referral to. So the steps here that sounds like what you're suggesting: more physicians need to get involved in some sort of screening process mm -hmm. and have this list handy of right. what to do. Because sometimes you don't even want to do a CBC because God forbid the blood count is off. It's like oh right. no, we got to do something about it. Yeah. So certainly you know if you find there's yeah. some major substance use problems right. as a physician, it's like. Oh, and this is this the stages of change, right? Somebody might screen positive, and they might say yes, but they might be really in the pre-contemplation. So they are not ready. So no matter what, what you say, you, they're not gonna go to any type of plan, the planning stage. So you have the pre-contemplation, the contemplation, and, and then be, the planning. That would be another example for physician to be very careful not to stigmatize the patient for not jumping exactly. into the treatment exactly. or the recovery that the physician thinks right. they need to get. It's great if they come back because maybe the next time you can guide them or support them from going to pre-contemplation to contemplation, right? Another question from the back of the room. I did have a question like following along what uh, the doctor was saying and from your experience, let's say like we're exposed, we're residents, so we're exposed to both inpatient and uh, outpatient, like primary care. So often we see patients that come to the ER with an overdose. So we take care of uh, patients with this condition in the floors. So when do you think it's a good time to just like offering the resources or offering kind of like the treatments that we have available for them without them feeling that we are judging them or just like stigmatizing them because often, and that's kind of like something that I see in this, uh, in patients with this condition, is that they don't follow us often. So they're like lost in the healthcare system. And it's like, I understand that it's in this <coughs> acute setting, it's not optimal for me to address this because you're, I don't know if there was a, like a situational uh, condition or like a situation that just trigger for you to have the overdose, or if it's just something that is routine for you. I, I don't know if that right. makes sense. Yeah, though that totally makes sense. And there's a couple things. One is, um, you know, asking the person, what's your story and how did you get here? Um, and most of the time people aren't going to, they're going to just just feel like, okay, you care. It's And, you know, share for a few minutes. Um, but many times you know it can become like a revolving door right the the overdose and the um naloxone um one is the the stigma they're not accessing treatment and um they might not have any availability if you don't have insurance right or you're underinsured there's only so many providers so there's so many factors however again referring to a peer support specialist that's a good starting place because at least it's something and they're coming to the ER but you can see how as a physician caught up in this yeah. systemic challenge it can certainly engender various prejudices and stigmatic thinking in exactly. the physician's mind exactly so so we have to be proponents for some of the things you suggest, and advocating for systemic change. Right, right. So we have a comment from uh, Dr. Gonzalez, who is a hospice palliative care physician. He says, even at the end of life, when an individual admits to having had substance use disorder, clinicians are often leery and judgmental when the symptoms are not controlled. Right. Your thoughts? Well, first thought is that how sad that is, the very end of life, and you're still experiencing judgment, you know, at the end of your life. Um, so that's my, that's my first reaction. Um, and because that patient felt safe to be able to share that with the physician. So, you know, even just saying, thanks for sharing that. That took a lot of courage to share that. Um, with with me 
um, and supporting someone in their end of life, right? Um, if they're on hospice, then you know, really the goal is to have quality of life during the end of life, right? So feeling supported, feeling heard. Um, and yet we see physicians in that specialty at that point still inflicting stigma right. on these patients. So we've, we've talked a few times here already about what we can do to move in a positive direction, to resolve some of these issues. Language, you've pointed out repeatedly, is important. Uh, teaching, teaching in, in the medical school, mm -hmm. teaching, somebody's calling with a Sorry. question, teaching uh, in, in all the various aspects of healthcare as, as you're doing at FAU right now yeah. to get this message out there. Uh, in terms of systemic changes, what about this whole issue of the traditional criminalization, criminalization of drug use. How does that affect this whole stigma concept? Right, right. Well, that's part of the structural stigma, right? So uh, a study that um, I'm conducting right now with the Department of Justice, we're working with adult males in the reentry and providing peer support and housing stability. And it's been statistically significant in terms of these interventions for long-term recovery and also decreasing recidivism. So we're, we're parceling out in the, in the qualitative data, what is it exactly with the peer support specialist that's supporting you to stay in recovery? And can you guess what the, one of the major themes are from the peer support, what they're experiencing that's helping them? Non-judgment, yeah. So there are these components of stigma, feeling supported, non-judgmental, feeling comfortable, and they have all these components that I think can be translated also in healthcare. That these, these constructs are so important. I, I would say from my lens, even more important than any particular treatment modality is our, is our way of being in our practice. Um, but back to the, this criminalization, mm -hmm. uh, war on drugs, et cetera, et cetera. How much has that hurt uh, our ability or our attitude as healthcare providers to serve these patients yeah. in a non-judgmental way? Yeah, I think huge. I think that's why only 10% receive treatment, right? Because of the war on drugs, right? Question. So I think I'm loud enough without the mic. I come from a very specialized world. I'm in the VA where we have integrated mental health primary care on our teams. Mm -hmm. If I need someone to be seen by a mental health professional today, after can seeing be. them, within an hour they're seen because mm -hmm. that's just our system we have it built in. Right. In the community, is there anything like that available? Clearly all practices don't have integrated mental health providers, don't have mental health providers available right mm -hmm. away. But is there anything available? We now do telemedicine. Is there, an, is there yeah. somewhere where you can call where you're up and say, I've got a patient here today. Sure. They've admitted they, they want to help. Can I dial up? A, is there something in the community that, like, in the yeah. state that has that available right away while they're still saying, mm -hmm. yes, I'm willing? Right. Getting them right then in that right moment. <laughs> and I, can, I can get it within the hour. And Absolutely. I, I get it within an you hour. have more resources at I the need, VA. I a button on the computer, a hot key, and I have a consult into my mental health team to come down right. and meet this person as they walk out of my exam room. Right. Is there anything like that in the community? So I can only speak to the program that we're developing with Dr. Allison Ferris in the residency program at FAU, where we have the Bethesda East and Boynton Beach, and we have a clinical social worker there. So they can have immediate mental health treatment, um, short-term treatment, and um, also addressing any substance use. I think that every primary care should have a clinical social worker, but again, that's my bias. <laughs> and again, systemic change, you know, with the new uh, 811 uh -huh, that's number, wonderful. which is set up for mental health and or substance use disorder uh -huh. problems. So that, you know, we're not quite sure how well that's working at this point, but the concept is there, it's online, and it is another resource, certainly, for patients and for physicians question that I have, over, an overall question here, you know, when we graduate medical school, we take the Hippocratic Oath or something similar to that, which is basically pledging to do no harm 
and part of medical ethics also is justice, to do no injustice to our patients. So with that in mind, do you, do you think it's reasonable that healthcare workers and physicians included should sign a pledge to use non-stigmatizing language and be less stigmatizing with their patients? Mm. Never, never even um, thought of that. Mm. I, I think it's a, such a personal, ref, it's so much reflexivity in terms of really evaluating yourself. So just signing it, I don't know how authentic it would be. Um, that's just from an educator perspective. Um, I think it's really important to have in social work and medical schools reflexive exercises and practice and in interviewing skills and really know where you're at in this and how do you feel. You know, I ask me, do you have a personal history or even with your immediate circle or friend, have you been hurt? Because that can impact how, how you treat your patients, right? We, did you have a question? Right. Is there a level of stigma that physicians aren't aware of? You know, like as you mentioned, you're tired, you're overworked, and you may not mean to be using that language. Right. right? But right. it's something that that's how you were educated in your time in medical school, and it's a behavioral change. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's actually a recent a study that just came out with a, a measurement on stigma for healthcare providers. So maybe we can connect and I can send that to you. I think it's great. Um, but also like the biggest, um, and this is just anecdotal, physicians and clinical social workers feel frustrated because, oh, the patient lied to me. Right? So then I'm done with that patient because that patient lied to me. They didn't do what I said or you know, they weren't truthful to me. And I always ask like this reflective question, if you were so ashamed about something and you were afraid that you were gonna receive some penalization or criminalization, what would you do? Would you try to protect yourself? So I try to shift it and that it's a, it's a coping mechanism, psychological coping mechanism to cope with shame because there's really no more difficult emotion than shame that we experience as human beings. It's very different than guilt. Shame, it's internalized as a human, that you are not fully human. So to, to how I'm gonna cope with that is maybe not tell the truth, or maybe withdraw, maybe isolate, or maybe even talk back at you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Has anybody experienced a patient get aggravated with them? Always think internal shame. You know, and if you were feeling shameful, what would be helpful in that moment for you? And so as physicians, how can we prepare ourselves better to deal in a non-judgmental way when those situations come up? Because our knee-jerk reaction is, oh, that patient doesn't like me, that patient doesn't respect me, right, get right. out of here. Yeah, they lied to me. Yeah, or... how can we be better prepared to, to deal with that in a more compassionate way? Yeah, I think, you know, assume that they've experienced trauma and that can help with having more empathy and assume that they're afraid you know and they're fearful so you know really having an empathic and trauma-informed approach and listening and what do you want to do now or what do you think and just trying to have an, an honest conversation versus getting aggravated and just dismissing the patient and probably taking yourself out of the picture, it's nothing personal. It's not They're personal. not really attacking you for anything you exactly. didn't do right. You just happen to be in, in that situation that they're going through. They're protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. There is so much to learn in medicine. Um, and you're at a stage where you are just stuffing your brains with um, facts and knowledge and uh, all of these other things. But there's so much more that your patients will teach you. Mm. And communication skills 
are going to be the bedrock of your medical practice. That's going to be so much more important than you ever thought. The facts and the information that you have now will mm -hmm. come and go. You know, in five years is like 16 lifetimes in medicine. You know, what, what I learned way back when, who knows, I didn't remember half of it and what it, and, and probably most of it's invalid by now. But the communication skills and what my patients have taught me has stood the test of time. So when we say, how do you learn um, to have better language? Nobody taught me that. I had to learn that as time went on. You know, I absorb what is current thinking. I pay attention to my lecturer. I pay attention to the opportunities that are given to me um, to uh, get better communication skills. Uh, those are things that you just don't go to medical meetings. You learn other skills along the way that will teach you to be a better person. When you are a better person, you will always be a better physician. I mean physician because that's a healer. And that's what we need to be. Yeah, thank you. That pretty well sums it up. Yeah, that's great. Pretty well does. Thank you so much for that. Anything else you'd like to add, Heather? No, I just I'm get excited because this can be transformational. We didn't have time, but I have dozens of stories of people that were homeless and using daily IV, um, heroin and fentanyl, and now they're finishing up their graduate studies. You know, so this, this, this really does make a difference. difference. Yeah. So Heather Howard, thanks so much for joining Thank us you. this evening. Heather's associate professor at the Phyllis and Harvey Sandler School of Social Work at Florida Atlantic University. Thank you so much for being part of our meet and greet first Thank session. You. We're going to be doing another one of these. So for those of you who enjoyed the food, come on back. It's going to be April 13th. And the topic, we have a physician in recovery who's also going to address a lot of these issues of how stigmatization made his journey very, very difficult and challenging. And uh, that will be here. And for those of you at uh, home who weren't here tonight to enjoy the Wagyu beef, as soon as you get the announcement, you want to jump in and register so you'll be able to join us on uh, Thursday, April 13th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.